Europe, Holland, Amsterdam. 15 kilometers from the city center, Schiphol, one of the world's busiest airports. More than 600 aircraft take off or land here every day. Sunday, October 4th, 1992, 2.40 p.m. An aircraft enthusiast takes this footage of an Israeli LL 747 cargo plane arriving from New York. The jumbo will load up and refuel before flying to Tel Aviv in Israel as flight LL 1862. 3 p.m. Loading begins, supervised by Jerry Plettenberg, LL's operations officer. Today's cargo includes consumer products, but some boxes are labeled dangerous goods. Jerry has a good idea what's inside. On LL cargo flights, he's seen a huge range of military hardware. Apache helicopters, radar equipment, aircraft wings, missiles, jet engines for F-16 and F-15s. All these weapons supplied the Israeli military, which is locked in a 45-year-old conflict with Palestinian militants. The ongoing crisis makes El Al a top target for Arab terrorists. Seven years ago, gunmen opened fire on El Al check-in queues in Rome and Vienna, killing 19 people. The airline stays on permanent alert for more attacks. Armed security guards keep a close watch on all its planes and personnel. And before loading, all freight passes through a pressure chamber to detonate any bombs planted by terrorists. 5.20 p.m. Flight 1862 has passed security checks. Now the crew arrive for their pre-flight inspection. The 747 is 13 years old, but it still has at least five years of useful service before retirement. 59-year-old Captain Yitzhak Fuchs is in command. Like many Al Al pilots, Fuchs is a combat-hardened veteran of the Israeli Air Force. He's got 25,000 pilot hours under his belt. Flying alongside Fuchs, a flight engineer Gedalia Sophia, and co-pilot Arnon Ohad, the rookie of the crew. Just 32, he's been flying jumbos for less than a year. Flight 1862's takeoff will be supervised by air traffic controller Henriette Van Opeinen. It was wonderful flying weather. You could see to the end of the world. All the flight paths in and out of Schiphol pass over densely populated areas of Amsterdam. Under one of them lies the Belma suburb, 13 kilometers to the east. At its heart, the sprawling Groenewein apartment block. It's home to almost 2,000 people. Among them, Marlena Treideman, a nurse, and Guillermo, her son. Every day planes would come over. You got used to that after a while. Guillermo will celebrate his 17th birthday in five days' time. He's a typical teenager, into pop music and martial arts movies. But today, he's been to church with his mother. The Troidermann's home is on the fifth floor of the Grunewein block. Marlena and her husband Stanley are originally from Suriname, a former Dutch colony in South America. Graciela, their 14-year-old daughter is a popular girl who's doing well at school. <laughs> always laughing, always happy. A positive word for everyone. <laughs> 6 p.m. On runway one at Schiphol, Captain Fuchs powers up the 747's four Pratt & Whitney engines. LL1862, ready for taxi. He hands over to his young co-pilot, Arnon Ohad, to give him more flying experience on the 747. Six minutes after takeoff, LL 1862 heads east over Amsterdam suburbs. Good evening, uh, we are now passing uh, 4300. 
6.27 p.m. and 30 seconds. The engines are still at full thrust as the jumbo climbs to 6,500 feet. Everything is running like clockwork. The crew settles in for the flight to Tel Aviv. In less than five hours, they'll be back on home soil with their families. Suddenly, a terrifying jolt rocks the plane. It starts to lose altitude and rolls violently to the right. Veteran pilot Captain Fuchs grabs the controls. I've got up. He battles to stabilize the jumbo. If he fails, the aircraft will spiral out of control. LL 1862, Mayday, Mayday, we have an emergency. After 30 seconds, Captain Fuchs manages to wrestle the jumbo back to steady flight. Flight engineer Sophia desperately scans his control panels to try to find out what's wrong. Seconds later, another crisis. The instruments reveal that both engines on the right wing are out of action. It's a pilot's nightmare. Captain Fuchs must get back to Schiphol for an emergency landing. Fast. He tells co-pilot Ohad he needs the airport's longest runway. We request 27 for landing. Air traffic control clears the jumbo for the journey back to Schiphol. In that case, heading 360. 360 to heading. Roger. The return route to runway 27 will take the jumbo over the Belma suburb where the Triderman family lives. They and thousands of others in the crippled jet's flight path are completely unaware of the drama unfolding above them. LL-1862, a fully loaded 747 cargo plane, is badly damaged and rapidly losing height. LL-1862, Mayday, Mayday, we have an emergency. 6.30 p.m. Fire crews race into position at Schiphol Airport, where the jumbo is due to arrive in less than 10 minutes. The 747 must make a descending turn over Amsterdam to reach the correct altitude and line up for runway 27. Its final approach will take it over the Grunewein apartment complex, where the Troidemann family lives. Marlena and Stanley decide to visit a friend nearby. They tell their children, Guillermo and Graciela, they'll be back soon. Six thirty-three p.m. and thirty-five seconds. You said to two thousand feet. Air traffic controller Henk Tebraka clears the stricken jumbo to land at runway twenty-seven. Okay, you have around thirteen miles to go to touchdown. Speed is all yours. The seven forty-seven is two minutes from the Belma suburb. Marlena and Stanley are halfway to their friend's apartment. It's a typical Sunday evening. Many people are at home with their families. It was very relaxed outside. You could hear the children playing. You could see the people on the walkways. At this moment, as Captain Fuchs lifts the nose to slow the jumbo for landing, the roll to the right returns. He jams the rudder further to the left, but now the plane barely responds. Co-pilot Ohad alerts Schiphol. Controlling problem. Controlling problem as well. The news sends a chill through Tebraka. He immediately contacts his colleague Henriette Van Opeinen. Henk, Henk summed that up to me by intercom and said, he is now in deep, deep trouble. 90 seconds later, Fuchs still battles to control the roll, but it's getting worse. And now the jumbo is losing height fast. It's just seconds from the Belma suburb. Here, unaware of the looming danger, Marlena and Stanley near their friend's apartment. Teenagers Guillermo and Graciela relax at home. Four floors up, at the other end of the Grunewein block, 31-year-old Andre Boss hears the approaching rumble of jet engines. You can describe the noise as getting louder all the time, and eventually, it starts to roar. 
Suddenly, the roll accelerates to an extreme 90 degree angle and the jumbo spirals towards the Belma. Race the flat, get your gear down. Going down, going down. Sink rate, pull up. The roar of the jet is now deafening. Andre grabs the phone to call the emergency services. Seconds later, a nightmare unfolds just meters from his home. I looked at the landing gear as it flew straight past my balcony. Marlena and Stanley reach their friend's apartment. In his 10th floor apartment, 36-year-old bank worker Renis Dehan is about to eat dinner. A screech from his pet cat brings him to his balcony. He's paralyzed by what he sees. The jumbo is heading straight for his apartment block. I saw my life go by in a flash from my childhood to that moment. I thought, it's over. Six thirty-five p.m. and forty-two seconds. LL one eight six two smashes into the sixth floor of the eleven-story apartment block. I heard a huge noise. It was as if a door slammed closed, like a bang. The impact knocks Renus unconscious. Burning aviation fuel rains down onto dozens of apartments. The sound of the crash came from the direction of Marlena and Stanley's home, where they left their children just minutes ago. The couple race back, gripped by fear. What terrible disaster has struck their neighborhood? And are Guillermo and Graciela in danger? LL 1862, a 747 freighter laden with cargo, smashes into the sixth floor of an apartment block in Amsterdam. Six thirty-five p.m. and forty-seven seconds. Air traffic controller Henk Tebraka realizes the signal from the jumbo has stopped. Up in the control tower, Henriette van Opeinen can see why. A column of flame and smoke reveals the jumbo has crashed. Marlena and Stanley Troydeman race for home. Suddenly through the trees, they see a towering wall of flame. Stan said to me, Marlena, it's our flat. I said, no, that's impossible. He said, Marlena, our children, our children. He was screaming. Stanley freezes. But Marlena runs to the burning apartment block. She finds a staircase and races to the fifth floor. I was only thinking, I need to find my children. I need to find my children. At the exact point where her home used to be, she's facing an abyss, a burning hole. I couldn't believe that my house was gone. I stood there and thought, no, I'm dreaming. It suddenly occurs to Marlena that her children, 16-year-old Guillermo and 14-year-old Graciela, may have heard the plane coming and escaped. She starts a frantic search for them. On the 10th floor, bank worker Renis Dehan regains consciousness. He staggers to his front door. To his horror, 
it won't budge. Shockwaves from the crash have shifted the frame and jammed the door shut. Renus realizes he survived the crash, but now he could burn to death. There's no way out. Not even his cat can jump from the 10th floor. I thought, this is the end. I thought if I come out, it'll be a miracle. Andre Boss's apartment, 200 meters away, escaped the impact. Now he rushes to the crash site to see if he can help. What you see is the enormous heart of the fire. You see flames come out of every house. Andre knows there could be hundreds trapped or injured, and many could die before firefighters arrive. With no thought for his own safety, he smashes open doors which are jammed or locked. Entering some apartments would be suicide. There are too many flames. But in others, he rescues people who've been overcome by smoke. Stunned local people rush to the scene. Marlena Treudemann desperately questions everyone near the crash site. Have they seen her two children, Guillermo and Graciela? Still trapped in his 10th floor apartment, Renus de Haan feels the temperature soaring as the blaze rages outside. At that moment, it was 58 degrees Celsius already in my house. I was sweating pints. Renus fears he's got just minutes to live. But he can do nothing except pray that he and his cat will be rescued. Just when he thinks he's about to pass out, neighbors break in. They rush him from the inferno in the nick of time. Six forty p.m. Less than five minutes after the crash, the first of sixteen fire engines from across Amsterdam arrives at the scene. Brave local people like Andre Boss have already pulled many survivors from the crash zone. Now firefighters take over the rescue operation and tackle the inferno. News crews capture the scene as paramedics start to treat the injured. Fifty minutes after the crash, Marlena still searches for her children. But no one has seen them. The terrible truth starts to sink in. She said goodbye to Guillermo and Graciela less than an hour ago and promised to be back soon. Now, all hope of seeing them alive again is fading. At that moment, At that moment I felt as if I was dead myself. I felt as if I had died inside. Why did this have to happen? Why did my children have to go? News of the disaster spreads around the world. As many as 200 may be dead tonight after the worst air disaster ever in the Netherlands. Dawn reveals a gaping hole in the building. The crash destroys 31 apartments on 11 floors. The official death toll is 43, including Captain Fuchs and his crew. The Netherlands Aviation Safety Board quickly mobilizes eight investigators. Franz Erhardt is a senior member of the team. He's a former fighter pilot with 20 years experience as an air accident investigator. But now he's facing his worst nightmare. 
You hope it'll never happen, but then it does happen. A large plane in the middle of a residential area with many victims. What triggered Holland's worst air disaster? And why did the 747 fly steadily for eight minutes after the mayday, only to nosedive without warning into a crowded apartment block? Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful day, and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really happened to LL 1862. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. Netgate's heading 360, 360 to heading. Earhart checks recordings from air traffic control at Schiphol. They reveal that co pilot Ohad reported losing power in both engines on the right wing. Number three and number four engine inoperative. Investigators know that two engines failing at the same time is almost unheard of. The team begins to suspect a more sinister reason for the loss of the Israeli jet. We thought from the beginning LL was possibly targeted by terrorists. The investigators fear that Flight 1862 was downed by a terrorist bomb or even a ground-to-air missile. And they have a second mystery to solve. If the Jumbo was hit by a missile, why did it stay airborne for a full eight minutes Sink rate, pull up. before dropping out of the sky? Sink rate, pull up. To see if the terrorism theory stands up, investigators need to find the Jumbo's engines and its black boxes, which record technical flight data and cockpit conversations. But it's a daunting task. Even if they survived the crash and the 1100 degree Celsius inferno, they now lie buried under a mountain of rubble. The plane had been broken into so many pieces during the crash that we didn't know where to start. Early the next morning, search teams start to sift through the mountain of wreckage. Investigators know they may face a long wait for clues. Then, an unexpected development. An off-duty policeman reveals that he saw Flight 1862 as it climbed through Amsterdam's airspace. What he tells the investigators gives them an electrifying new lead. Investigators have no concrete leads to explain why LL 1862 crashed into an apartment block in Amsterdam. Then, Jan Kaspers, a detective with the Amsterdam police, tells them an extraordinary story. On the evening of the disaster, he and an old friend were enjoying a yacht trip on Goemir Lake, 10 kilometers east of Amsterdam. Their boat was moored right beneath LL 1862's flight path from Schiphol Airport. At 6.27 p.m., they're preparing dinner. Suddenly, they hear a loud bang. What was that? Mass explosion. Kaspers rushes onto the deck. In the sky, he sees a 747. Beneath it, two objects are falling away. At first, I thought they were parachutes. And just as they were above the treetops, I realized that they might be uh, airplane engines. It's a startling revelation. Air crash investigator Franz Erhardt immediately orders a team of divers to search Goemir Lake. Recovering the engines could solve the mystery. It's now clear to investigators that the two right-hand engines didn't simply fail. Number three and number four engines in operation. They sheared off completely. Unable to see the engines from the cockpit, the crew had no idea what had happened. Now there's a new mystery facing the team. What could rip two five-ton engines off a 747 simultaneously? The case for a terrorist ground air missile or bomb now looks compelling. To prove this theory, investigators must recover the engines from the bottom of Goemir Lake and examine them for clues. 
against all the odds, after just a few hours of searching, a diver gets a lucky break. He spots a massive chunk of aircraft debris. The team quickly identifies it as the outer engine from the 747's right wing. And there's another key find on land near the lake. Pieces from a 10 meter stretch of the same wing's leading edge. It's the team's first chance to find out why the engines fell off. They rush the wreckage to their labs. Scientists swab the engine and the chunks of wing for traces of the chemicals used in explosives. They examine the metal surfaces for the telltale micro-pitting caused by blast fragments. It takes two days. The analysis draws a complete blank. Investigators can find no evidence of an explosion nor any other clue to why the engine broke away. It's a dead end. Now the investigator's only chance to solve the mystery is to find the 747's inner engine in the hope that it holds the key. Or to locate one of the plane's black box flight recorders at the crash site. The Dutch Navy joins the search for the inner engine. It deploys two specialized salvage vessels, sonar and more divers. But after two more days, they find nothing. The investigators are worried. With every passing hour, crucial evidence is slipping away. The water would start corroding the parts, and because of that, we were keen to find it as soon as possible. The news is equally bleak at the crash site. Search teams can find no trace of either of the 747's critical black boxes. To make things worse, there's another setback. Within 24 hours of the crash, the mayor of Amsterdam ordered diggers and bulldozers to clear the site. He's under huge public pressure to recover bodies as quickly as possible. Earhart and his team are powerless. Their only option is to follow the debris to its new home, an Amsterdam garbage dump. It seems a hopeless task. Then, after three days, Earhart is in his Amsterdam office when he gets a call. It's good news. One of his team has found the 747's flight data recorder. We were very happy. At last we could take a step forward in our investigation. This black box records all the aircraft's critical technical data. It could prove the breakthrough they so desperately need. But when they open it, it's a terrible letdown. The tape inside is broken in four places and data from the plane's critical final two and a half minutes is indecipherable. They send the recorder to specialists in Washington DC and the USA. It's a long shot, but it's their only hope. Eleven days after the crash, the investigation team is at rock bottom. But just as investigators are beginning to despair, they hit the jackpot. A diver finds the inner engine half buried by mud. It's still attached to the mounting that fixed it to the wing. Earhart and the team are excited but cautious. What if this engine proves as unenlightening as the first? It's battered and dented, but they can see no obvious evidence that it was hit by a missile. And when they run the battery of tests for explosives on this engine, once again, they find nothing. Investigators reach a turning point. They rule out a terrorist attack as the cause of the disaster. In fact, they can find nothing wrong with the engine itself. But when they examine its cowling, the outer casing, they quickly spot something odd. A dent and on it, smears of black paint. Where did it come from? 
they send the paint for analysis. But they must still find out why the inner engine broke away in the first place. Since the engine was still fixed to its mounting, the separation must have occurred at the point where it was fixed to the wing. The team studies the 747's engine attachment system. Four fittings hold the engines to the wing. At the heart of each is a 14 centimeter long hollow steel bolt called a fuse pin. The fuse pins are strong enough to take the load of a five ton jet engine at full thrust. But in some circumstances, they're actually designed to fail. If an engine suffers a crisis, like a mechanical seizure or a bird strike, it can vibrate violently. If the vibrations get too severe, the engine might tear itself free, destroying the wing with dire consequences. To prevent this, investigators know that all 747s have a damage limitation system. When vibrations reach a critical point, the fuse pins are engineered to snap, allowing the engine to fall away harmlessly. But there's no sign that the inner engine suffered a crisis. So the team must consider a chilling possibility. Did something go terribly wrong with a fuse pin system that led to catastrophe? The team examines the mounting that fixed the inner engine to the wing. They focus on what's left of the two central fittings which carry the bulk of the load. The fuse pins they held are both missing. But on one fitting, investigators spot something intriguing. The top of the lug that held the fuse pin has snapped off. Did this happen when the engine hit the lake or earlier? Metallurgists examine the brake and make a dramatic discovery. The stress markings are not typical of a violent impact. They reveal that the lug snapped because it was overloaded. They realize this can only have happened if the fuse pin inside broke at one end. This would transfer significant stresses and twisting forces onto the lug at the other end, making it give way. Fuse pins are designed to break at both ends if the strain on the engine reaches a critical point. Earhart believes that a partial failure can only mean one thing. Metal fatigue in the fuse pin. It's a startling new theory. Could metal fatigue in the engine's fuse pins be at the root of the disaster? But Earhart knows the inner engine would only shear off if both central fuse pins failed. To prove their theory, investigators will have to find the missing fuse pin from the other central fitting. The chances of finding such a tiny part in Goyemir Lake are remote. Earhart's only hope that a significant fragment was still attached to the wing when the jumbo crashed. He deploys more than 20 workers to search the garbage dump where crash debris now lies. No one holds out much hope. The missing fuse pin was only 14 centimeters long and may have shattered on impact. Looking for the essential parts of the wing mounting was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Forty-eight hours into the search, they have still found nothing. Then, on day three, one of the team spots a piece of metal half hidden by garbage. Yon, yon. It's part of the missing central fitting from the inner engine. And against all the odds, there's a chunk of fuse pin still inside. Investigators know it may be their last chance to solve the mystery behind the disaster. They begin scanning the fragment under an electron microscope as soon as it arrives from the rubbish dump. And they find their answer. In the wall of the fuse pin, 
there's a crack four millimeters deep. The patterns around the fault show all the classic signs of metal fatigue. The floor started along machining grooves in the hollow pin central bore. It's the breakthrough the team have worked so hard to reach. They already know that metal fatigue made one of the inner engine's two critical central fuse pins fail. Now they have indisputable evidence that the other central fuse pin was also defective. With every flight, the microscopic cracks in the inner engine's fuse pins got bigger and bigger. On October 4th, 1992, they reached a critical point. At 6,500 feet, with the engine at full thrust, the faulty fuse pins fail. But the investigation team still has to explain why the 747's outer engine came off as well. It's almost inconceivable that two sets of fuse pins could fail at the same time. Then they receive the test results on paint smears found on the inner engine's cowling. The smears are an exact match for the paint used on the central fan blade spinner of the outer engine. They realize there's only one possible explanation. The inner engine was at full thrust as the plane climbs. So when it shears off, it doesn't fall harmlessly away, it shoots forward. A split second later, it falls back and by sheer chance strikes the outer engine, smashing it off the wing. The impact also rips away a 10 meter stretch of the wing's leading edge. Investigators now know that a freak accident caused two engines to fall off flight 1862. Mayday, mayday. They alert the manufacturer of Boeing. It immediately instructs airlines operating the 1747s around the world to inspect all fuse pins and replace any that are faulty. But the traumatized residents of the Belma are desperate for the answer to another major mystery. Why the plane crashed? A 747 should be perfectly capable of flying on two engines. So what made flight 1862 suddenly nosedive just minutes from an emergency landing at Schiphol Airport? The Get the down. Investigators study the section of wing recovered from Goimir Lake. It's clear this damage would have reduced the plane's lift. They also realize that key flight controls lost hydraulic power when the engines broke away. But if this damage was severe enough to down the plane, how did Captain Fuchs keep it flying steadily for another eight minutes? It's a paradox. Then, 18 days after the crash, the team gets some good news. Experts in the USA have retrieved the information from the damaged flight data recorder. The technical readings it contains prove to be the final piece of the puzzle. They reveal in chilling detail what finally downed Flight 1862. Investigators know that metal fatigue caused one engine to shear off LL 1862 and smash off a second engine. The incident also destroyed a section of the right wing's leading edge and disabled key controls. Maybe, maybe we have an emergency. But the damage was clearly not severe enough to down the plane immediately. Why did it suddenly spiral out of control a full eight minutes after the Mayday call?
the team drops in test pilot and aeronautical engineer Hiet Tikala to find the answer. He analyzes thousands of technical readings from the 747's flight data recorder. After eight months of hard work, Tikala has a dramatic new insight into what happened to flight 1862. For the first time, he's able to explain the complex relationship between the loss of the engines, the mangled wing, and the damaged controls. He discovers that although the crippled plane could still fly, a crash was inevitable as soon as it tried to land. The crew had no choice. The crew didn't have a choice. They could do nothing else. They were doomed to crash. The flight data analysis finally reveals why LL 1862 nosedived without warning after pilots kept the jet airborne for a full eight minutes. And how hundreds of people on the ground were left seconds from disaster. Eight minutes to disaster. Defective fuse pins holding the inner engine to the wing snap, causing the plane to lose not one, but two engines. This catastrophe also damages a 10-meter stretch of the wing's leading edge, causing a major disruption of airflow over it. This reduces lift on the right-hand side and makes the 747 roll to the right. Captain Fuchs has also lost two hydraulic systems, controlling key anti-roll devices. He only manages to wrestle the jumbo back to level flight by pushing his remaining controls to the limit. The flight data analysis reveals that his current airspeed of 280 knots is the key. It's just high enough to get sufficient lift out of the right wing to keep them aloft. 39 seconds to go. Five kilometers from the Belma apartment complex. Now Captain Fuchs lifts the jumbo's nose to slow the plane down for landing. Unaware that this routine procedure will have fatal consequences. The flight data reveals that this change in angle worsens the disruption in airflow over the mangled right wing. The result is a further loss of lift on this side of the plane and it starts to roll again. Captain Fuchs struggles to pull it level. But his airspeed has now dropped below 260 knots, reducing lift even more. This time, his damaged controls cannot save him. Problem. 30 seconds to disaster. As the roll and loss of lift reach a critical point, the 338-ton jumbo plummets earthward. Get the gear down. 1862 going down. LL 1862 nosedives from 2,500 feet. Microscopic faults in two 14 centimeter long components lead to the death of 43 people. Rescue workers found the bodies of 16 year old Guillermo and 14 year old Graciela the morning after the crash just meters from where their home once stood. Medical experts believe they were killed instantly. After the disaster, the children's parents, Marlena and Stanley, moved to another part of Amsterdam. They couldn't bear to live in the area where their children died. It is not easy, that give I hope to. It's not easy to lose your child or your children. But but you can get strength from the good times you've had with them. Memories from their birth to their death, no one can take away from me. I know they are here. I feel their presence, a good atmosphere. The apartments in the crash zone were demolished. 
but their foundations remain. Nearby is a permanent memorial to the victims. But the disaster also leaves another legacy. Boeing goes on to strengthen all 747 engine-to-wing attachments, including fuse pins. It also rolls out a more stringent inspection regime with new ultrasound testing to detect metal fatigue. The changes brought about by the Schiphol crash make every 747 flying today a safer aircraft.